I read a headline uh, recently. It, uh, it said, scientists develop 3D medical viewing labs similar to Star Trek TV series Holodeck. So how could I resist? We <laughs> called uh, Mr. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Sensen, and uh, try to find out what, uh, what's really involved in all of this. I, um, I tried to communicate to him that City TV was already uh, the Federation station, and, <laughs> <laughs> and that space uh, was the imagination station, and, uh, and that Idea City um, is really fascinated by uh, the potential, the extraordinary potential of, uh, of the new science. So here he is, Christoph. Uh, he was born and educated in Germany, but he has been living and working uh, in Calgary for many years now. And uh, he's here to tell us, I'm going to read this because it's hard to conceptualize, uh, how he can stand inside a strand of DNA as part of a 270 degree larger than life projection of the smallest parts of our biological makeup. Christoph. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Can I get the first slide? I'd like to show you my first slide here because like Mark, I cannot really convey to you what you can see when you come to my lab. So I want to invite everybody in this room, and I think it's about 500 people, and send me an email whenever you are around Calgary, and I'm a scientist, so I figure that you're not all going to come next Monday. <laughs> and I can tell you that since, since we opened on February 28, we have had about as many people as are in this room through the cave already. So it's, it's feasible and it's possible to do this. So don't be shy. Send me an email when you're in the area. Come by. It takes us about half a minute to fire it up. It's in standby mode any time. Can I get the next slide, please? What I want to talk about is imaging using caves. And this is not really a new idea, as you can see from this slide, because this is the cave in Lascaux, which is more than 10,000 years old. So having cave walls being used to project images is a very, very old idea. It's nothing really new. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but the way we use our cave is different, because we can create virtual reality inside the system, and we can actually enlarge things. And like Mark, I need to see things blown up. I, I cannot shrink my world. I have to expand onto my world in order to understand a little better on how the human body works and how it's organized, because that's a very, very difficult question, as I think the, the human body is probably the most complex machine ever invented by anyone. So this is what it looks like here. I'm standing in the human heart. And you already see that I'm wearing special glasses. And I'm going to explain to you how these work in the next few slides. And you see a few of the heart valves here, two of them actually, one with the ligaments going through and the other one from the other side. So you can really be inside the human body, which is one of the dreams that humans have had for a long time. And I'm going to show that to you too. Give me the next slide, please. The way it works is very simple. You have all experienced this before. Your eyes, if they see two slightly different images of the same object, basically render the stereo view, the three-dimensional reality inside your head. So if you have a red-green glass like here, and you broadcast a TV show with two slightly interleaved images, this is actually Barnacle Bill from the Sojourner uh, mission to Mars, uh, which is from the NASA website then you will see this image in 3D as soon as you put those glasses on. Because one of your eyes will see a green image, one of your eyes will see a red image, and in your head, these two images merge into a three-dimensional object. We do this much fancier than just red and green. We have polarized light, and we do it much, much fancier than just a TV screen. So if you could go to the next. We have a computer system that has four graphics cards and four projection walls. So this here would be a single one, but we have four of them. And three of those are walls. And the fourth one is a floor display. And these four graphics cards display a seamless image of the same object, which you can see here. This is a very simple landscape, but follow this, this road. It goes from one screen over the floor, and it goes up again onto another screen. Or look at this house here. 
this is on one screen on this side and on another screen on this side. <coughs> so that's the principle on how it works. It is not very tricky, but it makes remarkable impression on anybody who has ever been in there. It creates an object right in front of you that you want to touch. It's as realistic as real life, almost at least. Give me the next slide. And it certainly resembles this here, which is the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise. So it's the same, exact same idea. And in this case, I'm not even sure who was first because this imaging technology was developed about 10 years ago. And the holodeck, I don't know, I'm not the expert, but maybe you know more about it, was only introduced in one of the very recent Star Trek series. So they may have actually copied from real life from this one rather than the other way around. As you know, probably uh, Motorola's flip up uh, cell phone was probably one of the most uh, most uh, uh, close to enterprise developments ever. And it hasn't sold because the cell phone signal was so great. It just sold because everybody could say, beam me up, Scotty. So <laughs> <laughs> certainly, marketing and development go hand in hand here. But in this one, probably the technology in itself uh, has been around for a longer time. Why is it then that? There has been such a huge hype about this particular one. There's two reasons for it. First of all, our programming environment is generic. Anybody who has a computer around here that runs Java can write a program at home that we can automatically stick into our machine. You do not know that you write for the cave. You can just write a 3D program wherever you want, on a Macintosh, on a Linux machine, on a PC. And when you're done with it, you can come to us, and we can show it to you by surrounding you with it. That's a marvelous breakthrough for all life science because these machines still cost about $4 million. Canadian, that is, so about 400,000 US dollars. <coughs> <laughs> um, that is certainly a breakthrough that is very important to us because the best imaging right now is not done in North America. It's done in South America and it's done in Asia in places where they didn't have the money to put everything into genome research, where they had to be working on more traditional methods like electromicroscopy and light microscopy. So I spend a lot of time, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, where they have imaging that we have never seen here in North America at all, to bring these things into our cave. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like as close as it gets. This is a computer rendition of space station, uh, the International <coughs> Space Station. And here you see it comes basically all around you. So this, this is a very close rendition. Uh, the color is a little off. It, it gets a little more colorful if you see it in, in reality. So if you're ever in the area, please come by, because this is as close as I can describe to you on what you will really experience when you come. So what do we do with this? Give me, give me the next slide, please. We want to understand how organisms are organized and how they function. And there's two ways of doing this, and this is the first approach. Which, is, which I call the bottom-up approach. So you make an inventory, a catalog of everything that you found, like all the genes, all the proteins. And we have done this now by sequencing the entire human genome, for example. And then you take all your components and start sticking them together, which reminds you of the olden days here when we were playing with Lego. And this is actually a DNA molecule built from Lego by Paul Thiessen. So I found this on the website. Somebody really did this, right? Building molecules using Lego blocks. Uh, but you only get so far because we have very, very little knowledge on how these components are organized and how they connect. We know nothing to the point that we can really stick them, these things together to a, a bigger global context. So there's another approach that hasn't been tried very much that we want to go for. Can you give me the next slide? And that's the downed airliner approach. This is actually Swiss Air 111. I used to live in Halifax for seven years uh, before I moved to Kerry about a year and a half ago. And this was one of the tragic accidents that was happening while I was there. And so I was very close working at the National Research Council to what they did afterwards. They basically drenched the ocean, took all those little pieces, but they knew already what the shape of the plane would look like. So they built a wireframe, which is this thing here, and they started to map all their little pieces onto it until they had basically rebuilt the plane. It's not functional. It has a lot of gaps. There's a lot of missing pieces. But now you can connect things because they're in the right space. They're in the right orientation. So now you know a lot more, and you can design experiments that will help you to connect those non-functional uh, systems and probably make them into functional systems over time. 
this is going to take many, many years. Many, many years from now, we will be probably able to, for the first time ever, simulate an organ, say the liver or the kidney, based on all the evidence that we have, mapping these onto the wireframes. So how do we get our wireframe? Give me the next slide, please. As you may know, there is projects like the Visual Human that give you images of the human body. <coughs> There's a lot, <coughs> a lot of different imaging. This one here is the light microscopy, the anatomy series. It's thousands of images, slices through a human body. We are now building a wireframe based on these slices by combining them, sticking them together, but not stopping there. We will then define for the computer what a brain is, what a kidney is, what the shape of the bones is, so that the computer starts to build a model rather than just an image. And this is what we call object-oriented approach. So everything becomes an object that can have certain features to it. It can do certain things that we know about it, that we have gone, gotten from medical uh, information, physiological information, behavior, you name it, whatever you want. Yeah. <coughs> Give me the next slide. Certainly, much of the information will come from the inventory that we now have, which is the entire human genome, as you can see here. So we have it all. We know what pieces we have to look for. We don't know how these all interact today, but hopefully in a few years we will be able to get to the point that we can connect more and more of these features into a coherent model and then really stand inside the human body like in the next slide has been envisioned many years ago. So that's what we are driving towards, even though I don't expect during my career, I'm 42 years now, to see that really happen. So all we do in my lab is a much humbler goal. We are building a platform that allows us to do these things in the future. We are thinking about what technology will it take to do these things and make them happen. We do not have any of this technology to the perfection today that we will need, but I hope that we can at least stimulate a discussion now that will allow us to go forward and develop this to the point where we can start modeling these things in real time. The goal is to understand enough of the human body to get at, at these complex genetic diseases. These are diabetes and cancer and Alzheimer's and a few others, where not a single gene is responsible for the disease. And you can just identify this gene and say, here's the pill that will cure what this gene malfunction does. Complex genetic diseases have been worked on for a very, very long time, but nobody has yet found a final answer on how to cure cancer or how to prevent it. And we will not be able to, to do this unless we understand what the, what the complex mechanisms are that are behind these kind of diseases. So one day in the future, one day, next slide, you might meet this <laughs> medical emergency program <coughs> which is entirely based on computer information. Of course, it will take a long time to get there, and it may look slightly different because one of the most asked requests for is to have it in the shape of Pamela Anderson rather, rather than this one here. <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot of requests like that. But uh, <laughs> if you want to hear my personal opinion, I think I'd ask Moses next time he does an interview with Shakira for much music or much more music, take a stereo camera, take a few stereo pictures of her, because that's what I'd really like to model in the case. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first part. Uh, put the slides off. Uh, I leave, actually, I want to introduce you to the weapon that scientists use to protect themselves from the audience, the laser point. And I leave it here because some of the other uh, speakers after me wanted to have it too. But now I want to sit down and talk a little bit on how I got there. Because I think the green light is still on. I have another five minutes plus minus to tell you how, it, how you get to the point to think about these things. When I was 10 years old, I decided that I wanted to be a biologist. And that was probably straightforward to think back today, but it was very hard for me because my entire family was in building houses. My father was an architect. My grandfather had a construction company. My father met my mother, who was running uh, the little three-wheel truck for my grandfather from uh, construction site to construction site. I was the oldest son, so I was expected to take my father's business when I grew up. 
But when you are 10 years old, you say a lot of things. So you see a plane above and say, I want to be a pilot. And you see somebody cleaning a chimney. And yeah, you want to be a chimney cleaner, right? <laughs> I never changed anymore. So the, the moment I had my first time biology class, the first day, I came home and said, this is what I want to be. And I set my mind, and it never changed anymore. And of course, people said, you can't do things like that, right? So I didn't listen very much. Uh, so after a while, they started giving me biology books for Christmas and stuff like that. So I have a huge, <laughs> huge library at home of biology books starting in the 1970s, because that's when I started to believe that I wanted to be a biologist. A little time later, I found out that there's a lot to this business of biology. So I made up my mind and said, I want to be a PhD. And I, again, got lots of opposition because there were people in my family who had tried to get a PhD and they couldn't get it. So they said, you can't say things like that, right? First go to university before you think, say things like that. And again, like I had set my mind, this is what I wanted to do. And this is where I wanted to go. So I went through my military services as quickly as I could. Being in Germany, I had to do 15 months. And I went into university. Believe it or not, in the first week at university, I went up to a professor and said, can I see you in your office? And he said, yeah, sure, come by. Just talk to me, sure. And I went in and said, I have just one question for you. How does one get to be a professor? <laughs> and he said, you know what? I should kick you out of my office right now. But OK, not too many people ask me these questions. So <laughs> let's sit down and talk. And we talked for about two and a half hours, and he hadn't answered my question at all. Because he told me. <laughs> He couldn't. <laughs> but he told me, you don't ask things like that in university. <laughs> so it went on like this forever. I, I always got these, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and don't think about it. Just let it happen. And after a while, I found out that that was the way to go. Just drift and let things go. So I became a botanist. I dealt with plants. And not just that, I dealt with algae, which really upset my father, because he didn't understand at all what I wanted to do with this. So his most asked question was this, algae, is that what we'll eat in the next century? And I said, maybe not. <laughs> because I don't think the protein contents are really right for humans, so probably not. So he never really, really uh, went with it, because he just couldn't get the message. But really what I became was a molecular biologist. I worked with algae, but I worked on a level where we work with DNA and proteins and all those other things that are in human bodies as well as in algae and in E. coli and wherever you, you look. So my, my technology was generic. Only the organism that I worked with was a little, little weird, maybe. So then one day, I was done with my PhD. And I got a phone call from a guy at EMBL, which is Heaven for Molecular Biologists, and asked me, do you want to work in the yeast sequencing project? And if you think back a few years, that was the big topic before the human genome. And basically, I just said, yeah, sure, I'm going to come. And six weeks after I went there, which is like the NASA of, of molecular biology, I don't know, it's probably the best equivalent, I got an email from Canada. And it said, we just heard that you went to EMBL. Do you want to work in Canada at the National Research Council for us and do the same thing there? And I said, well, if you get me the money, then I certainly would want to come to Canada and work here. So I did. In 1994, I came to Canada, and I did the only ever complete sequencing project that Canada has done, the Sulfur-Lobus genome, which was 3 million base pairs. And we finished it, and we published it last year. So it's all Canadian, all done. And we're, we are very proud of that. But that never got me into the newspapers. <laughs> right. I don't normally work in the circles that get me into the press or into Time magazine or whatever. But the most unusual thing that happened was when the University of Calgary phoned me and said, we want you to switch to Calgary. Just name what you want, and you will get it. And that's how I got to the cave, because I said, where I see this all going, it's going to become so complex that nobody un will understand it anymore. So I would like to be able to image these things in 3D. And they basically worked with the province and the federal government and a lot of industry and got it done. And that's where I am today. And so there's one question. That's the most asked question. Not the one about Pamela Anderson. That's only our second most. <laughs> and the most asked question is from United States folks, mostly. And that is, goes like this. Why in Canada? 
My answer is don't even ask that question, okay? But I can give you another answer, which is probably more honest. Why in Canada? Because we are team workers. To make this all happen within a year, it took 230 people or more to coordinate this. In Canada, we can easily do this. I don't know many other places that are capable of doing this, but Canada certainly is a, a country where young scientists like myself can achieve these things because it's a general teamwork effort. It's not just a single effort of a single person. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thanks.